Hi everyone, my name is Dan and I'm a mental health pharmacist and today I'm going to be giving an introductory lecture about antidepressant medications. I think that this presentation is really important because no matter what area of pharmacy you go into, you will certainly see patients on these medications. So if you go into clinical pharmacy or community pharmacy, you'll see all sorts of patients on these medications. And even if you go into another area of pharmacy, you will certainly have friends or family members on these medications and ask you questions about them. I have three major objectives that I'd like to go over today. So hopefully by the end of today's presentation, you'll be able to explain the appropriate indications of antidepressants, understand major depressive disorder, and compare the various drug classes used in the treatment of depression. My presentation will be broken down into three major sections. So this table of contents slide will help to reorient us as we progress through the presentation. First, we'll talk about the indications of antidepressants. Second, we'll talk about major depressive disorder. And finally, we'll talk about an antidepressant drug class review. So without further ado, let's go into the first section, which is indications of antidepressants. As the name implies, antidepressants are used in the treatment of depressive disorders. In the DSM-5, there are a few subcategorizations of depressive disorders, but the one most commonly heard of is major depressive disorder. And of course, these medications are used for these. A question is, other than depression, what else can antidepressants be used for? So the name is tricky for patients because these are called antidepressants, but we use antidepressants for a lot more than just for depression. So not only do we use them first not only do we use them for anxiety disorders, they're first line for a lot of anxiety disorders. So this can be really challenging for patients when they come in, they're diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, and then they're told that they're going to be started on an antidepressant. And the patient will say, "Well, I don't have depression, I have anxiety." And then you have to explain, "Well, it's just the name antidepressants. We actually use these for a lot of things." So antidepressants are used for a lot more than just depression. They're first line for a lot of anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, they're used in obsessive compulsive disorder, they're used in eating disorders. Some antidepressants are used for pain, some are used for sleep, some are used for migraines, they're used for a lot of different things. So we know that antidepressants are used for a lot of different things, but at least there's only a few options to choose from, right? And unfortunately, no, there's a whole lot of antidepressants out there. So antidepressants can be thought of as an umbrella term, and under that umbrella, there's a whole lot of subclasses of antidepressants. So we have selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, other or atypical antidepressants, tricyclic antidepressants, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and even adjunctive medications. So there are a lot of subtypes within antidepressants. The final wrench is the FDA-approved indications. So most of the antidepressant medications are FDA approved for major depressive disorder. Technically not every single one is, but most of them are. Outside of major depressive disorder, some have specific approvals for other things and others don't. So for example, in generalized anxiety disorder, escitalopram and paroxetine are two SSRIs that are FDA approved for this. Whereas if you wanted to use another SSRI, you would technically be going off-label, even though in most instances that's considered okay. There's a lot more FDA-approved indications with these medications as well. So you can see some eating disorders, some pain conditions, even smoking cessation has an antidepressant that's approved for it. So my first question here is, antidepressants are not used in which disease state? Post-traumatic stress disorder, fibromyalgia, smoking cessation, or diabetes? So take a minute to pause and think about it. And the answer is diabetes. So antidepressants are first line in post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, one antidepressant is FDA approved for fibromyalgia. One is FDA approved for smoking cessation. And although antidepressants can be used in diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and they help with neuropathy, they don't help with the diabetes itself. So diabetes would be the best answer. Okay, so that was what I wanted to cover in the first section. So what I wanted to cover is that antidepressants are used for a whole lot more than just depression and that there's a whole lot of types of antidepressants. Now let's start with an introduction into what major depressive disorder is. So when you're thinking of mental illnesses and the diagnosing of them, 
Something that will often come up is the DSM, and we're currently on the fifth edition, so the DSM-5. This is the manual that standardizes the diagnosing of mental illnesses, so that if you see a psychiatrist in California with some symptoms, and you see a psychiatrist in New Jersey with some symptoms, you should end up with the same diagnosis. This is really important because most of our diagnoses for mental illnesses are made using subjective things, not objective measurements. For example, if someone has diabetes, you can check how much sugar is in their blood. If someone has high blood pressure, you can check their blood pressure. But we don't have an easy way, for example, to check serotonin levels and determine if someone's depressed. So really, you're basing this diagno diagnosis off what the patient's telling you and what they're presenting with. So this here is the DSM-5 criteria for major depressive disorder. So you'll we'll often hear people say that they're feeling depressed today, and the, the language of depression has made itself into a common social term, but they don't actually often mean that they have depression. So someone saying they're depressed today might actually be saying that they feel sad, whereas major depressive disorder has this specific criteria to be diagnosed. So there has to be five or more of these symptoms over at least a two-week time period. It's often a lot longer before the patients present, and they have to have a change in their level of functioning, meaning they're feeling so sad or feeling so down that they're not going to school or going to work or interacting with their friends or family members. Additionally, one of the symptoms has to be depressed mood or loss of interest or in, in pleasure. And then the following symptoms can be any of them. So it can be weight changes, insomnia changes, movement changes, energy changes, concentration changes, a whole lot of things. So to summarize the DSM-5 criteria, it's either depressed mood, loss of interest in ple or pleasure, um, at least a two-week time period, additional symptoms, and a loss of functioning. There's a way that's taught to kind of remember the symptoms, and this is the SIG E CAPS mnemonic. So when I'm talking to someone with depression or major depressive disorder, I commonly go through these symptoms in my head. So once we talk about them having a depressed mood, then I go through some of these symptoms. So how's your sleep been? Are you sleeping more than normal? Are you sleeping less than normal? Are you having trouble staying asleep, falling asleep? So really getting into some detail. For interest, I ask, what do you like to do for fun? And say they respond that they like to read. I'll, I'll ask them, since they've been feeling depressed, are they still able to enjoy reading? Or maybe they don't like it as much. Next is guilt. So I'll say, many people who are depressed will start to think about the past and things they could have or should have done differently. Does this apply to you? Then I'll talk about energy, any loss of energy. And then I'll talk about concentration, so I'll relate this back to their interest. So you said you really like to read. Are you able to concentrate on your books, follow the storyline, follow the plotline, or have you been having trouble concentrating? Next I'll ask about appetite changes, so any weight gain, weight loss. Then I'll observe for psychomotor agitation, so are they fidgeting, are they bouncing, are they moving their hands, moving their legs? or psychomotor retardation. Are they moving really slowly? Or are they talking really slowly? Finally, I'll ask about suicidal ideations. So you'll see in psychiatry that people just outright ask, any thoughts of wanting to hurt yourself? Any thoughts of wanting to hurt others? So this mnemonic is a good way to help remember to go through the symptoms of depression. There are both nature and nurture components to depression. So many people have at-risk genes for depression, and then those people experience trauma, abuse, sexual abuse, bullying, stress, and it causes these at-risk genes to be expressed. Um, that being said, there's also many people with at-risk genes for depression that never express those genes. So there's certainly, in many cases, a mixture of the nature and nurture component. Prevalence of depression is quite high, so over a two-week time frame, 18.5% of American adults had symptoms of depression. Luckily, the majority of those were mild symptoms, whereas less people had moderate symptoms and even less had severe. But still, 18.5% of adults having some degree of depression at any given time is quite a lot. Also, the average age of onset is important, so younger people, 18 to 29, have the highest prevalence. This then goes down a little bit in the 30s and 40s, but then has another mini peak in the late 40s, 50s, 60s. Here's some artist depictions of depression. So there are many people with depression. There's many creative people with depression. So I just thought these images were good and wanted to share some of them. 
knowledge check question. Which of the following is not found in the diagnostic criteria for depression? Appetite changes, anger changes, sleep changes, or concentration changes? So feel free to pause and think about it. And the answer is anger changes. So people with depression might have some irritability or might have some anger changes, but it isn't a specific thing looked in in the criteria. Another major point is the suicide and crisis lifeline. So this used to be a long 1-800 number, and uh, the music artist Logic made a song with the title of this old suicide hotline number. And there was a published study that showed that after he presented the song and it became really popular and really famous, there was an increase in number of calls to the suicide hotline and a decrease in suicides. So just awareness of this number and people knowing about it really helps. That being said, the number changed from a big long number to 988. So similar to how you call 911 in an emergency, you can call 988 in a mental health emergency. So spreading awareness about this number can be really helpful to your family, friends, your patients. Okay, so I hope that second section was helpful in defining the diagnostic criteria of major depressive disorder and talking about some of the stats and some of the things you can do when someone has major depressive disorder. The final section that we're going to go into is an antidepressant drug class review. So start with a knowledge check question. Which of the following mental health professionals can prescribe medications? So feel free to pause and think about it. And the reason I ask this question is because many people don't know the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. So the best answer here is psychiatrist. So psychiatrist is a medical doctor with specific training in behavioral health and psychiatry. Psychologists can have a doctorate, like a PhD, but they're not medical doctors and um, do not prescribe medications. There are exceptions to this. So five states allow psychologists to prescribe medications, but the best answer here is D, psychiatrist. So it's good to know the difference between a psychiatrist who's a medical doctor and a psychologist. So the first classes of medications that we'll go into are SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and SNRIs, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. There's some commonality in the naming, so you can see some oxetine, italopram, and faxine. So here is a list of the SSRI medications. The first one was approved in 1987. This was fluoxetine, brand name Prozac, and this really had an impact on society. So there's many books titled with Prozac in the name, and there's many movies and many journals and things written about Prozac. So these medications are really important to know about because you will certainly see patients on them. Very similar to medic a very similar class of medication, so SSRIs are selective to serotonin, SNRIs are not selective to serotonin, and also work on norepinephrine. There's four medications here. They are also commonly used. How do these medications work? So these medications work um, in an interesting way, and it's not fully understood since they work in the brain, and the brain is very complicated. But these medications work on neurons. Neurons are nerve cells, and for the purposes of this explanation, we're going to talk about neurons as being brain cells. So brain cells communicate to each other through chemical messengers. So this image here shows brain cell A on the top communicating with brain cell B via these green diamonds that represents serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter. So these are how these cells are talking to one another. Someone with depression or anxiety, um, their brain cells aren't talking the way that they should. So we give these medications to help. So you can think of brain cell A on the top is releasing a puff of serotonin and your body likes to be really efficient, so it has this reuptake pump that sucks up some of that serotonin so it can reuse it later. Um, what a SSRI does is block this reuptake pump, so brain cell A releases the puff of serotonin, it blocks the reuptake pump, so more serotonin is out there in the synapse and more likely to bind to the following brain cell. So this helps, to, uh, helps the communication between the brain cells. How SNRIs are different are they don't just block this reuptake pump at serotonin, they also block it at norepinephrine. So your brain cell A shoots a puff of norepinephrine, it blocks the reuptake, and that norepinephrine has a better chance to bind to the next brain cell. 
We do not have objective measurements to look at. So like I said, we don't draw serotonin levels or norepinephrine levels to see if someone's depressed or responding to depression. So we try to make it as objective as possible with measurement-based care. So this picture here shows the PHQ-9, which is a common depression score or scale. And we will give someone a number to their symptoms. So if someone's really depressed, they might score 25. And then we start them on a medication, we might re-administer the scale in a couple of weeks and it might go down to 20. And then we check it again in a couple of months and it goes down to 10. So we're able to put an objective number onto their subjective symptoms of depression. So using scales is really helpful and important in mental health care. Some side effects of SSRIs and SNRIs can be seen here. Some to highlight are, since there's a lot of serotonin in the head, uh, anxiety and headaches, and since there's a lot of serotonin in the gut, GI effects. You might be thinking, didn't you just say that antidepressants are used first line for anxiety? And they are. But sometimes when people start these medications, their anxiety gets a little worse before it gets better. So the thing with anxiety, headache, and nausea and these GI effects are these are often, almost always, transient side effects which means that they go away with time. So if someone's having these side effects, if they stick with the medication for a little bit, it almost always goes away. Next, these medications are serotonergic, so they have sexual dysfunction. They can also cause hyponatremia, which means low sodium. This is especially seen in older patients. Next, they can cause serotonin syndrome. This is especially seen if someone's on multiple serotonergic agents, meaning multiple different medications, or really high doses of serotonergic agents. This is potentially life-threatening. It's relatively rare, but it's important to know about and know some of the symptoms. So there's a clinical triad of symptoms, mental status changes, autonomic instability, and neuromuscular abnormalities. Another thing to be aware of is something called discontinuation syndrome. So if a patient's been on an SSRI or an SNRI or even other antidepressants for a long period of time, you don't want to suddenly stop. Suddenly stopping them can cause the patient to kind of feel like they have the flu and that they're a little acutely depressed and a little more anxious than they normally are. And you'll hear patients describe these electric zings or electric shock sensations. So if someone's been on an antidepressant for a long period of time and wants to stop, you should taper them down over a period of time. So the SSRIs and SNRIs have very similar side effects, but since SNRIs don't just work on serotonin and also work on norepinephrine, they have some additional side effects. So you can think of norepinephrine like noradrenaline, which is like adrenaline. So increasing the amount of that can cause increased blood pressure. So if someone's depressed and also has high blood pressure, you're probably not going to pick an SNRI. SNRIs can also cause some sweating palms or, or increased sweating. The norepinephrine piece though, although it adds some extra side effects, it does add some extra benefits. So the SNRIs are used for treatment of pain. They're used to treat fibromyalgia, neuropathy, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, so they can be helpful in this regard. All antidepressants have a black box warning of increased suicidality in pa patients age 24 or younger. So monitor your patients very closely, especially if they're young patients. These can also activate mania. So if someone is misdiagnosed with depression when they really have bipolar disorder, if they're started on an antidepressant, there's a chance that the antidepressant works too well. So it takes them from depression to euthymia, which means normal mood, all the way too high into hypomania or mania. So be really careful with diagnosing the patients and using this for the right disease state. Next, there are platelets, uh, there are serotonin receptors on platelets, so there's a slight bleeding risk with um, antidepressant medications. The contraindications are use with an MAOI and hypersensitivity to the individual agents. These are often used in pregnancy and can be used in lactation, but you want to do your best to limit medication exposure as most as you can, but th these medications are sometimes used in pregnant and lactating patients. Next question is, which of the following is not a common adverse effect of SSRI treatment? sexual dysfunction, worsening anxiety, worsening depression, or headache. So take a minute to think about it, to pause, and the best answer is worsening depression. So SSRIs can cause sexual dysfunction, they can cause worsening anxiety, remember this is often a transient effect and the anxiety sometimes gets worse before it gets better, and they can certainly cause headaches. They 
sometimes don't work for depression, but it would be atypical for them to actually worsen depression. So I wouldn't say that this is a common side effect. We talked about SSRIs and SNRIs. Now we're going to talk about the other antidepressants. So these are essentially a cluster of antidepressants that all have their own mechanism of action. And instead of making all these different drug classes with just one medication in them, we lump all these atypical or other antidepressants together. The examples can be seen here, bupropion, bertazapine, trazodone, velazodone, and vortioxetine. These medications do have unique mechanisms of action. So for example, bupropion is a norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor. It doesn't affect serotonin, so it doesn't really have sexual dysfunction. Um, mirtazapine is an alpha-2 antagonist, so this doesn't work on reuptake pumps, whereas this works on increasing the release of serotonin and norepinephrine. Trazodone is used all the time in psychiatry, but it's used in low doses for sleep, rather than in higher doses for actually treating depression. Some side effects, so bupropion does have a risk of seizures, and this was especially seen in underweight patients. So someone's depressed and has an eating disorder, you're probably not gonna pick bupropion. Or someone's depressed and has a seizure disorder, you're not gonna use bupropion. Bupropion can also be a little bit activating, so if someone's having trouble sleeping, might not be the best option. Next is mirtazapine. So mirtazapine is a first-line option, same with bupropion, for the treatment of major depressive disorder, and mirtazapine is pretty sedating. So if someone's depressed and having trouble sleeping, this could be a good option. But if someone's depressed and sleeping too much, this might not be the best option. Next is trazodone, and like I said, it's used all the time as an as-needed sleep aid on inpatient psych floors, but it's not commonly used for depression anymore. There's two newer um, serotonergic antidepressant type medications. So we have the lazodone and vortioxetine. So they do kind of work like an SSRI, but they're a lot more complicated. They're still pretty expensive in the US, so we reserve these for once patients fail a few other treatments generally. Side effects are similar to SSRIs. And for a lot of these other medications, they're a lot less studied in pregnant and lactating patients, so probably wouldn't be your first option. Next we have the tricyclic antidepressants. So these, this is an older class of medication. This was first, the first one was approved in 1959. And these medications were used for depression very commonly for a very long period of time until the SSRIs were released and invented. These medications work by being pretty much like an SNRI that has a lot more binding sites. So a really non-specific SNRI. So they are serotonin, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, but I like to think of these as a ham-handed or ham-fisted SNRI. So ham-handed or ham-fisted means like a clumsy attempt at something. So this is how I remember the mechanism. So it's a ham-handed SNRI. Ham stands for antihistamine for H, anti-alpha for A, anti-muscarinic for M. And this also explains a lot of the side effects of the tricyclic antidepressants. So by being an antihistamine, it's, they're sedating, they can cause weight gain. By being an alpha blocker, it can cause low blood pressure, orthostasis, falls. And by being an anticholinergic, an anti-muscarinic medication, it can cause dry mouth, confusion, constipation, side effects like that. There are a difference between secondary and tertiary amines. The secondary amines are generally well tolerated. And if you are going to get a TCA drug level, in the patients on a tertiary amine, you also have to get their secondary amine level. These medications aren't used too, too commonly, but it's some good information to know. Some side effects are seen here. So sedation, they are antihistaminic, but if you really think of that ham-handed thing, the antihistamine, anti-alpha, anticholinergic, you can think of a lot of the side effects. These also have the black box warning for increased suicidality, all antidepressants do, and some contraindications can be seen here. These are sometimes used in pregnancy and lactation, but nowadays they're used a lot less than SSRIs, SNRIs. So you might be asking why did TCAs fall out of favor if they were used for so long until SSRIs were invented? And it's not due to efficacy. These are just as effective as SSRI medications. The problem is tolerability. So they have a lot more side effects, and one of the biggest issues is that they can be fatal in overdose. So roughly a seven-day supply of tricyclic antidepressants can be fatal, 
Whereas SSRIs, you can take a whole month's worth and it often won't be fatal if that's the solo agent in overdose. TCAs are cardiotoxic in overdose and the way to treat a TCA overdose is with sodium bicarbonate. So how I remember this is I think of a car crushes a tricycle. So sodium bicarbonate crushes a tricyclic antidepressant. The final drug class that we'll talk about is monoamine oxidase inhibitors. This is more of a historic drug. They still do exist. They still are sometimes used, but it's pretty rare. Here are the options um, and how these work are they work on an enzyme called monoamine oxidase. This is an enzyme that breaks down the monoamines. So if you inhibit the enzyme that breaks down monoamines, you get a rise in your level of monoamines. And monoamines means serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. The biggest problem with these medications are the dietary restrictions. So a, when you eat protein, your body breaks those down into amino acids. One amino acid is called tyramine. A person not on an MAOI can handle like 400 milligrams of tyramine easily. Someone on an MAOI who gets a little bit too much tyramine, roughly like 10 milligrams, can cause a hypertensive crisis. So their blood pressure can skyrocket. So if someone's depressed and on an MAOI and eats the wrong cheese or wine or sauerkraut or fermented food, they can have their blood pressure raised to really dangerous levels. So we don't commonly see MAOIs used anymore. Next question would be, which, which class of antidepressant would not be prescribed to an actively suicidal patient? SSRI, SNRI, other, TCA, or MAOI? So feel free to pause and think about it. And the best answer would probably be a TCA. So they sometimes can be used in someone who's actively suicidal, but remember, these are fatal and overdose, so you don't want to give someone the tool that they can use to then commit suicide with. So be really careful with TCAs and overdose. So we went over the indications for antidepressants. So antidepressants are used for a lot more than just depression, and there's many different types of antidepressants. Then we talked about major depressive disorder, what the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria is, what some of the symptoms are, and then we went into an antidepressant drug class review, talked about SSRIs, SNRIs, other, TCAs, MAOIs, all sorts of different types of antidepressants. So in summary, they have a lot of uses. Uh, knowing the class gives you a lot of side effect information, and the major classes are listed there. Some terms to know include the difference between psychologist and psychiatrist, uh, what a neuron is, so a nerve cell or a brain cell, what a neurotransmitter is, so how these cells communicate with each other, and what a monoamine is, so dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. So I hope that met the three objectives for today, and thank you so much for listening to my presentation.